This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Stephen Luke, man. How are you, brother? I am doing excellent, staying uh, COVID-19 free up here in South Dakota. So, well, it's, 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 yeah, you don't have too many. You're not like L.A. You, you don't no. have – it's or New well, York. Well, I, I mean we literally have like the population of like one high-rise building in New York. So we're pretty pretty safe out here for the most part. Are you, are you staying quarantined or are you uh, kind of – I mean I guess this is going to be recorded. So yes. I'm very quarantined, <laughs> safe, secure in a bunker in uh, you know old missile silo from the '60s. Yes. No, we're we're kind of yes, we kind of have you know doing the social distancing, but trying to uh, it's life is a little bit kind of like normal here. So, got it, got it. It's fair enough. Yeah, you're a little bit more spread out than the big cities. Uh, yeah, and everything takes two months to get to us, so I'm sure in August. That's, what <laughs> that's when you're going to have some stuff going on. Well, um, thank you for being on the show, man. Um, before we get started, how did you get into the film business? Okay, that no, that's a fun story. So I think like with everyone else, you start off when um, you're young, and you kind of just the, the magic of cinema hits you, and you get really excited to, you know, um, see films and you want to tell stories. And I think that's kind of uh, how I wanted to get involved and, and, you know, wanting to tell stories and, you know, just kind of progressively working up to that point throughout my life and career and how to just kind of, you know, tell stories and make movies and, and getting bigger and better. Very cool. So you were bitten by that bug basically. Oh yeah. <laughs> and you can't well, get rid of it. No, it's, 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 you know, it's like that artist lifestyle, right? So it's like mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if if I wasn't doing this or I mean whatever I'm doing, I'm sure I'd be you know doing something artistic. So got to express. Now, it. now, but you also got into the acting side of the business as well. Yes, yeah. So I always, you know, I do act. Um, what's fun about the film business is it really is a business, and there's lots of. Um, pieces that come come to that so the acting stuff that i do i i consider that usually like my art mm -hmm. like it's more of an art form to me if i come in and act um it kind of gives me a chance to dive into a character and develop them and be someone else and uh, that's very it's fun for me to do that uh some of the other parts of the film making experience are more business related or more kind of world building or you know writing or something like that but uh, the acting is is uh an art to me and it's it's always kind of fun to get to jump in someone else's shoes. But did you start off as an actor and then moved into producing, or did you start off as producing and, and moved into acting? I think I mean, acting. You know, in high school, you know, you do plays and stuff. Yeah, so sure. I, the acting was kind of always kind of that what you want to do. I kind of realized really right off the bat, right as I kind of graduated high school, that I wanted that. I could act and produce. Those are my two things that I enjoy doing the most. So I kind of found myself when I produce things, trying to find you know pieces, you know, like a, a part that I could play to kind of kind of have some fun with it as well. Because producing, for those that know, is a little stressful. <laughs> a bit, a bit, a bit, and you've got to wear like a thousand different hats, and you got to know the industry really well. So and it's like when you get to act, you know, you kind of can just. One character, and, and then no one bugs you either. You know, like right. they don't want to disturb him when he's in character. Like, yes, yes. So leave me alone until uh, until that's over. Then you can deal with all the craziness. It's fun because I've always been, I've always worn a thousand hats in any of my productions. It's just the nature of what I do. I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades. So when I get to just do one thing, it seems so light. <laughs> like, well, it definitely does. Well, you sit there and you're like, you're like twiddling. You know, it's like. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, like I should, I should be doing something. I should be helping someone. So, yeah, from from my really micro budget films where I'm doing a lot to where I'm working on a, a you know on a series or something like that where I have a full blown crew, and now I'm like I don't have to worry about lighting. I could just tell someone to go light. It's just kind of what am I gonna do? What am I doing here? I I don't. It, I'm waiting thirty minutes for the lighting setup to set up. I mean, like, what do I? The actors are ready. Like, I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, I guess I'll sit down. I guess I'll I guess I'll relax. I guess I don't know. 
<laughs> I'll have a Coke. So then how did you get into, you know, producing full features? Because I saw you did a lot of shorts prior um, to kind yeah. of to get your, your feet wet. How did you get into doing full-blown features? Yeah, so I, uh, yes, I always think it was important to do some short films, test, test your craft, um, do some, you know, uh, make some mistakes, learn a lot. Um, to me, and shorts were kind of a great way to do film school. I never, I didn't go to film school. I took more of the business side of things and got a, you know, kind of when I was in college, got a business degree because that was what I felt was going to be more helpful to me just in terms of what I kind of wanted to pursue. Um, but yeah, short films, great way to kind of hone your craft. And then you want to make that leap to a feature film if, you know, your goal, and there's lots of goals, obviously, but if you want to try to, um, tell bigger and better stories. If you want to try to make money, I mean, relatively speaking, um, that you, you kind of, the feature film game is where you need to be. And naturally that's kind of the next step that a filmmaker should try to pursue. Um, it has its own, I mean, making a feature film and a short film, they almost are, they almost have the exact same challenges and go through the exact same steps. You just are feature film takes is longer days. Mm. So it naturally was that next step that that one takes. So one of the reasons I wanted you on the show is because a lot of the, the a lot of the the movies that you've produced have been with, uh, you know, name talent, talent that actually brings money to the table, and and I always wanted to have someone on the show that has produced these kind of films, worked with talent like Dolph Lundgren or Ron Perlman or Mickey Rourke or Tom Berenger, Billy Zane. These are like kind of go to character actors who have a have a following and also have a value a monetary value uh in distribution and overseas so i wanted to kind of dig into the how you do this and i also want to take away a lot of these myths and illusions uh that a lot of filmmakers have like oh i could never afford you know a, Don, a you know Dolph Lundgren or Mickey Rourke or 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 Ron Perlman or these kind of actors because they must be billions and billions of dollars to to get. And I've been in the industry long enough to know that that's not true. But I wanted to hear it for, straight from the horse's mouth. So how do you go about first of all attaching uh, name talent like this? Right. Okay. So I think the um, and I'm a big proponent of this. Always the first step with name talent is your script. Now, obviously, that kind of can play in a lot of key points with lots of things, but if you have a, a, um, a script that obviously is what you feel like a, a winner, something you enjoy, a story you want to tell, that is definitely like the number one way to get talent to say yes. They've got to like that script. And, and, and so kind of hand in hand with that, the role that you might be offering them it has to be a role that, you know, like you see that person, you know, like, okay, like take, take Dolph Lundgren, like Dolph will have fun with this role or, you know, so like when you come to those towns so, and sometimes that might mean you, you adapt your role a little bit for the specific person that you're going after, but like they have to like, okay, if they read this, they've never done that character before, or maybe it's a character that they enjoy doing. So I think really tailoring um, your story and the role that you're going after before you present it to them is, is, um, is vital because if it's just generic, you know, office worker, you know, they're going to pass on that. So, unless, you know, unless, yeah. unless the paycheck is extremely high. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's going to take probably double what maybe they would actually cost because they're like, <laughs> well, for one to pay me that. Like, why would I'll you, do. why would you bring Dolph Lundgren as the office worker unless it's a comedy and then yes. <laughs> And you have the budget to do it. And that probably actually would be hilarious. I mean, Dolph is a great guy, too. I mean, he's a fantastic actor and a super smart uh, man. No, I hear and, he's like he's like genius level. He's like really, really smart. Even the, when he did the Expendables, they would made jokes about it in the movie. They're like, what are you, a brain, like a rocket scientist? Like he is like literally a he, he, he's that smart. And so like when you first kind of meet him, you, you, when you talk to him, it, I don't want to say it throws you for a loop, but you know, you, you, most people grow up with, I will break you. <laughs> and when he talks to you, you're like, well, geez, this guy's way smarter than me. Right. It's not like that. I'm filming. You're just, it's just, it's, it's a fun story. Okay. So back to, so you got your script, you mm -hmm. got your, um, you got your role for the, for these guys. So probably the, like 
they always talk about like the gatekeepers that come that are, that are in Hollywood. Yes. So for, for the talent, it really is their managers and agents. I mean, manager, agent, they guard those guys and all their clients, which is that that's what they get paid to do. So <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to probably the best way then to like, you know, to get an agent and manager. Okay. You know, having um, a, a producer that maybe has worked with them in the past, uh, having, you know, maybe a sales rep that has worked with them in the past, uh, you know, personal contact, emailing them straight up on IMDb sometimes even can get you to the door. I mean, I hate to say that, but like, you know, they oh, might yeah. have an assistant, but they re they read, I mean, if they have an assistant, they process that stuff. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're going to get Dolph Lundgren in your film if you just email them with an offer because they it doesn't but, work that way. <laughs> well, it doesn't work that way. But if you have a level of, um, if you're attached to someone that maybe has worked with them, the legitimacy of that offer of the script and the role and maybe the price tag that you're offering them, it, they, they will take it to their client it, that they're, they're required to take those things to their client if they feel it's actually a, a legitimate thing. And so by having someone, and I'm just going to use like me, for example, like I've worked with Dolph Lundgren, you know, for me to maybe put like a filmmaker in touch with his manager and saying like, Hey, I think that, you know, the, the, you know, X, Y, and Z wants to, you know, is interested in having Dolph with the role, you know, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let him present it over to you. They will take that as a sign that I vetted that person. I wouldn't be doing that unless it was a real thing. Um, just in terms of, 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 of real. Cause if I do that, you're, you know, you're Donnie Braskoing it. You're, he's a good yeah, fellow. <laughs> if, if this is not like a, a real thing. I might not never get to work with that agent ever again. So that's why it's such a big, you know, it's a big deal to be able to be, you know, when that happens, they'll take you seriously. But I'm not saying that they don't just email them straight up. Doesn't work. Real quick. So, so let me, let me jump on that real quick. One question. And this is, this is big question yeah. when it comes to talent. And I've heard both sides of the story. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you have a personal relationship or a personal connection to the talent, do you bypass their management and talk to them directly or make an offer to them directly if you have a, a direct connection? Now, if you're good friends, it's one thing. Yeah. It, yeah. That, that, that's but, a, if you're buddies, it's a, one thing. But let's say my produ like I know somebody who knows the actor personally. And I'm yeah. like, hey, look, I'll, I'll make you an associate producer if you make the introduction to me. And then I go have coffee with Dolph. And then Dolph's like, hey, I really like your thing. And I make him the offer directly. And then I've completely bypassed. I've, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just throwing out the scenario. Hold on before you say no. Um, and you like talk to them and like, hey, look, uh, you know, I'd like to offer it to you directly. A lot of people will do that faux pas, which in my opinion too, you shouldn't offer them directly unless it's a conversation. You know, like I always say, when I'm working with talent of that level, I go, do you want me to submit a, a formal offer to your agent or manager? And sometimes they're like, no, what do you want? What do you got? And they'll, and they'll just want to negotiate with you right oh, there. Sure. There's those, those, that, that, that talent as well. So what do you uh, yes. I would say like, if you're in a situation like that, 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 I mean, if they're open to it, that, that might be different. I would say, in my opinion, if you were in that situation where you're like, talking to the actor and they're loving the role, you know, like just offering them a role and having them say, I love this. I want to do this is like a win. Mm -hmm. And then I would automatically go to, Oh, right. Great. I will get in touch with your agent and manager mm -hmm. and work out the details because at the end of the day, you still got to work out the details with the agent and manager. Cause there's not only is that, I mean, I always at their price, there's their green M and M's that they need. There's their <laughs> flights, you know what I mean? Like there's an entourage that might have to come. So like, you're still going to have to work with the agent manager on the deal memo. And so you should, if at least in that way, the agent manager feels, um, I don't want to say useful because they're very useful, but that's their job. So respecting them right off the bat and saying like, Hey, great. Dolph loves this role. Let me go work it out with the agent manager. They will instantly, I, I don't want to say like you have an ally, but you won't make them mad because agents and managers do not like to be circumnavigated because no. that's their they don't like it. And I can, and you know, as much as like 
sometimes you wish you could just go right to it. And you can sometimes when you know the talent, you know, get them excited about the role. That's already a win for you because you know that they're going to want to do it. They Mm want to do it. And then go back to that, you know, agent manager. That way everyone stays happy. And then the actor's not having to deal with any, you know, the, the, other than the money, the other, the other things that entail that agent manager can be the good guy, bad guy, good cop, bad cop, you know, there was, it's a, it's definitely an industry. And I had an a manager tell me this. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, like always like great, you know, the talent, they want to do the role, then just come back to me and keep it, keep in that line. Hollywood's very much like, yeah, there was a there's a story of a couple of filmmakers I knew that were they bum rushed an actor at, at a film festival, and got him literally in the back alley. This is an Oscar nominated actor, and the uh, and the actor was cool. He was like, "Tell me, pitch me," and he showed him like this the sizzle reel, and the actor was very taken by their story, and this actor does not do an independent like he he's only studio, but for whatever godforsaken reason. He fell in love with the story and wanted to do it. And he was at over at CAA, and CAA did everything to tor- to torpedo that deal, like everything. But then, but you know, those guys did. I mean, but the thing that those guys got, they knew the actor wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. So CAA lost all those playing cards. Now they might not have been happy about it, but like that's that is the one nice thing if you can get around them and you can just find out if they want to do it. Then you bring- got. Right. You got the But then afterwards the the actor just turned to their agents like, Look guys, I don't care what you say, I'm doing this, so let's make this happen. And that and that's but that's a risk. You're rolling the dice when you do something like that. That's extremely risky. To, yeah, to if you something. can find an actor in a back alley and corner him, I mean <laughs> Literally I, I would do it, but Right. And they were just they were young independent filmmakers. They weren't like, you know, seasoned profession season No sometimes that's literally I mean, you get lucky like that. I mean, it's kind of just, you get lucky and he, everything, the stars lined up and that worked out great for him. So I definitely am not uh, opposed to having that happen because sometimes when you're trying to get your film made, I mean, you gotta, you gotta play hardball. And that mm -hmm, corner is hardball, man. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So you were continuing. All right. So now, uh, so what's the next, the process as far as attaching these guys? So, so let's, um, story script. Contact their agent manager, you know, so then you're you're wanting to it's the it's the money, you know, sometimes with a lot of this talent, it really does come down to, you know, they're going to assume after they read the script that they're going to, OK, this is a worthwhile story script. I, I can enjoy this character. Then it really comes down to their rate. You know, what are they willing to do it for? And it really is. I mean, oh, and I, let me back up because it is money. But like the, it, like, OK, well, who's 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 maybe who am I acting along with? could matter to mm-hmm. like, who's the director the director what's the budget of the film like do i have to fly to taiwan because that makes a big deal to them like or can i just wake up and roll out of my bed and go 30 minutes over to pasadena and shoot and then come back i mean that's that huge makes it you know, that's mm-hmm. huge able to do that for them so like accommodating them along with that offer with like, Hey, we're going to be, you know, 10 minutes away from your house. So all you have to do is just get out of bed and we'll go pick you up. (laughs) We'll come pick you up. And you know, so sometimes like literally that, if the money's good and doing that, and they can be like, well, I don't really care who I'm in with and who the director is. It's a day. Yeah. It's a couple days and I'm home. I'm I'm back home to sleep in my bed. So one day or two days or whatever it is. So that's the thing that a lot of filmmakers, especially young producers, don't understand is that if you have, you know, Dolph, let's say, uh, or Mickey in a role and you have them on the cover of the poster, it doesn't mean that you shot them for three or four weeks. You know, you could shoot them out in two, three, four days or less, depending on what how big their part is. But you can shoot all their right. scenes out quickly uh, and affordably, because if you tried to hire them for three or four weeks, it wouldn't be it would be cost prohibitive. Um, yeah, and they don't do that either. I mean, they they wouldn't they wouldn't sign on to doing a three four week thing unless it was a big studio you know, or super big or a studio or or a big project. Um, if you kind of live in that world of a week or less, mm-hmm. two weeks, and if you're 
able to co coordinate the character around those those scenes. I mean, a good rule of thumb, I think, right now with distributors is, you know, they need about 12 to 15 minutes of screen time at least out of those guys, which is about the equivalent of about 15 pages. So if you can get 50, I mean, how quickly can you shoot 15 pages? Now, mm -hmm. I'll tell you this, like, you know, usually, I mean, I've knocked out an actor in with 15 pages in one day. Oh, yeah, is me too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's doable. But I will tell you this, with the talent, like, they will not be happy about that, per se. I mean, they're not going to be angry. Yeah. But like, it could take cue cards, and it could take, you know, like, hiding their lines in, you know, spots so they can just do their thing. And it could don't, take... Earbud. Yeah, earbuds. Earbuds. Don't forget the earbud. <laughs> Oh, I forget about the earbuds. I literally, I had a whole, I had a whole VFX job once that I, this was an Oscar winning actor who was later in his career and he had earbuds because he couldn't remember his lines and we had to digitally remove all the earbuds in all his shots because it was a period piece. Sure. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, you know, it's insane. Yeah. I mean, you would... I shouldn't say you would think the actors would come prepared. They usually are prepared, but you know, if you can just get them there, I mean, they know, they know, you know, a lot of the actor, you know, like when they're named actors, they understand that it's going to be my name and my face on the poster that sells it. So who cares if I know my lines? I mean, that's not saying that they don't know that, but like, you know, you got to accommodate them sometimes. So this is the big, the, the big question, you know, can we discuss the cost now we're not going to call anybody out directly. We're not going to go, sure. well, Dolph is this much. And then, you know, Mickey is this much, nothing like that. But can we talk about a range, uh, you know, per day? Cause I have, I've, I've worked with certain actors and I know of, of prices of certain actors who are name actors. Um, but what is a range price? Because I think people still filmmakers still think like, Oh, I can't afford that guy. Even if it's for three or four days and you'd be surprised that you might. Yeah. Well, I think you're looking at, and I don't mind saying these things because I think they're, they're stuff that the, you know, the industry should know. And I think, you know, I mean, the more kind of money that can go to, like with projects that can go to actors, I think always the better. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't think it's you know. So let's talk about, so let's talk about money. So maybe let's put a range of say $50,000 to up to three hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. that is your that is your budget range and you might get an actor of a of a name caliber for one day to eight days or seven days seven let's say seven days so i mean that and to say that that's obviously there's a lot of factors and a lot of ranges that that can play into that but that's really not it is a lot of money but for for those guys you know, that that could secure the the rest of your budget and that could propel, you know, your film into going to that next budget level. I, and like like I'm not trying to get down on any micro budget filmmaking, but because I love I mean, that's like my forte. I love like how can we not do it the cheapest? But like, I mean, geez, you got to get those costs. Yeah. Get the cost down with, with those micro budgets. You're going to hone your craft. And if you want to try to, you know, those stars will automatically jump your film out of a micro budget capability just because of the, how much they cost. If you were to try to pursue them just in terms of like, you know, let's just say you, you spend an actor a hundred thousand dollars on an actor. Well, you might have an additional 20 to $30,000 other costs, mm -hmm. you know, with cr different crew lighting, mm -hmm. you know, green M&Ms, you know, you should sure. support that. There are those days that you're, you're shooting with him. So that's a, that's a factor you gotta, you've got to play, but I feel like it's a, it's a, to, you know, with filmmaking and, and movies to go to that next level and to have name talent, you know, it's a, it's a, that's what it will take in order to take that kind of next baby step, you know, in terms of like maybe then moving on to having a, a studio or a distributor, you know, trust you with maybe more money and with m more name talent, you know, in that next step. And if they can see that, you know, hey, this film with this talent, you know, these guys made this and it turned out great or, or whatever it was, profitable, you know, different things depending on what you're trying to do. It will help you just kind of take those steps in a filmmaker's journey if, if you want to pursue that. So um, I, I highly recommend, it, recommend you know, all the, uh, the filmmakers listening to this, you know, that 
can help really be the next little baby step for you in order to take the the, the bigger leap to bigger budgets and and bigger you know productions. That, and that's not to say you know there's always that wild card you get lucky and stars you mm. know jump out, which is every everyone's dream. But you know baby steps sometimes. But you have to look at it as an ROI. So like if you if you're spending uh, you know a hundred thousand dollars on a talent that could justify a $2 million budget without that yes. talent, you're looking at a $500,000 budget, you know, for the same movie or, or less. less or much, much less, you know, so yeah. it, it all ranges. You have to just kind of think about it. So, you know, if you have Mickey or Dolph in your movie, you've, you've got the movie sold almost done in pre-sales and we'll talk about pre-sales in a minute, but it's almost sold automatically because of their because they, there's an automatic market for that kind of talent involved yeah. now as far as ranges are concerned i've heard you know 50 to 300 thousand is a good range but i know guys who will show up for five grand a day and 10 oh, grand sure. a day and and if they go oh for a week give me 25 grand and we're good um and they they might not be at the level of the 50 100 200 thousand but they start peppering the cast and you can yeah. can you talk a little bit about the peppering of the cast where you get these known faces? They might not be box office draws, but they're faces. One of the big ones was Trejo for the longest time, and now oh, he's yeah. Danny. Danny, I, and I've gotten to work with Danny. I've always wanted to. I but it's that. isn't it by law that he has to be in every movie? I mean, that's law now, isn't it? I mean, he has to be in every movie. Him and Sam and Jackson. That- <laughs> has that been fortified? But I think it has. You're right. I think it has. I think I think the Supreme Court is checking on that right now. But I think it's Sam Jackson and or Danny Trejo have to be in a movie. That's the law. Um, I think but right. but I, if I remember right, the law also states they can't be in the same movie together. Otherwise, the world will be ripped the, yeah, apart. The, the, the uh, space time space time continuum explodes. I understand completely. <laughs> but um, no. But I remember Danny before you know, Machete and he was, before he became a leading man, he was the character actor and he was in, I mean, he's literally in everything, you know, he just shows up. It's fascinating to watch Danny. Um, and he's the first to say, he's like, I'll, did you have a check? I'm there. And can I bring my tacos? And he has this, and and that's not racist. He has his own taco company. Um, I believe (laughs) it goes Trejo's tacos here in LA. Um, but it, it was fascinating. So how can you talk a bit about the, the value of peppering some of these uh, more character actor faces in a movie, which kind of also gives you a little bit of weight when trying to go after a bigger fish, too? Like, oh, look at all these other guys who've been in a million things. Yeah. So I would say um, if I was approaching like a film where we're going to pepper in some some, you know, dec- you know, some some recognizable faces, so maybe TV actors. Yes, you'd want to try to get as many of those guys as possible. One of the nice things that um, if you were to pursue that route, okay, you know, that will help. I always, you know, it's always hard to say like, and then for your next project, but like maybe bigger talent that, you know, for future work that you do when they look back and they say, okay, well, we've got all these things. Let's see what they've done. Like, okay, well, they've worked with Danny and they've worked with this. And they're like, okay, well, they, they've, they've worked with some industry people. So sometimes, you know, establishing yourself of being able to work with industry people will help propel that next, you know, also be a little bit of a baby step for you to kind of, if you want to make bigger things. Now, um, peppering guys in, I would say, yes. I mean, like the more recognizable faces, you know, obviously the better. I would also they'll throw this in with a caveat, like really do your homework and research because there might be like Danny Trejo, uh, I'm not super familiar with like i i don't want to put like actors as if they have values but i know danny trejo is super popular in the united states so like Mm -hmm. you're trying to get a distributor to bite on having a danny trejo in the movie Uh, but with that said can i throw a caveat in there real quick sure yeah there was a movie there was a there was a a a movie that i worked on which had uh eric roberts in it and and Eric is a, is a face, and, and, and distributors generally liked Eric Roberts, and, and do still. Unfortunately, Eric did 25 movies that year. So, oh, when, sure. so when the director went to go sell, the producer went to go sell his movie, every distributor's like, I already got three Eric Roberts movies this year. I don't need yours. So there has to be a balance as well. 
Um, yeah. You know, so. <laughs> well, and I think that that's why it ties into like if you're going to pepper it with 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 faces, you know, really do your homework. Right. Because you don't want to have. I'm not trying to put down Eric Roberts, but like you said, yeah, sure. You don't want to be in the season where there's 25 of his movies already. Right. He's diluting his value. He's diluting his value. Diluting his value. So just, you know, do if you're going to pepper and use some different faces, which can work great and maybe be easier, do your do your homework, do your research, you know. Don't, you know, don't be afraid to call like producers from other films with talent that you're looking at. Yes. Call them. Yes. Email them. I would love to have someone email or message me and so I can tell Mickey Rourke stories. I, and I don't mean that like in a bad way, but like I can like, listen, this is what you need to do. This is what you, you shouldn't do. You know, try to do this. Like, I mean, we, we, I feel like, you know, when you're in the filmmaking community, especially the independents, you know, we all have war stories and battle scars. And mm -hmm. to be able to help the other, the next person, like avoid, you know, like, okay, well, this is a pitfall. Try not to do that if at all possible. You know, we're I, Lieutenant I, Dan. We're Lieutenant Dan. The new oh, privates are. We're Lieutenant Dan. The privates are coming in. It's like, don't yeah. salute me. Get down. Do this. You're gonna get burned over here. Like that's who we are. Essentially, is <laughs> what we what right. you try to do. And like a lot of producers, a lot of us are very much like that. So give give those give those guys a call. Shoot them an email message. They'll they'll shoot you straight because you know at the end of the day, it you know the younger filmmakers like you don't want to say like who you help could be the next whoever, but like it really could be beneficial, you know, to just relay some information and, and uh, cause you paid for it in blood, sweat and tears. So, you know, don't let it die. Don't let it sink with the ship. So, At least that's my thing. so with that said, uh, can you tell some Mickey Rourke stories or Dolph Lundgren stories that are, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, appropriate for the show and that uh, won't blacklist you from the industry? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, let's, let's okay. Okay. So a quick Mickey Rourke story. So, uh, one of the things when Mickey Rourke first showed up on my set, uh, he, or, or at least when he showed up at our shooting location, he arrived late at night and me and my other producing partner went, went, uh, went to go meet him. And we, we kind of, we brought his costumes and everything and Mickey Rourke, he enters the hotel and he looks right at us. And he walked right on past us, right on past us, and his assistant. Yeah, and we were like, "Did he? Did he not? Did?" Because we had the costumes, so we assumed like, "Okay, we, mu we must fit the film." I mean, we said that we were going to be there with the film, and you know, we're like, "Well, maybe he didn't see us. I don't know. Like, what's going on?" And later, his like assistant came out of the hotel and just said, "Like, look, we need the costumers here. We don't want to see the producers." We're like, "Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, okay, fine." And so we we get the costumers in there. They're doing their thing, and later on, like. I can't remember if it was later that night or early in the morning. We find out like um, Mickey would not like to have uh, the producers on set. Uh, if Mickey sees the producers again, he's going to punch them in the face. And we we're like, and not and not leave his trailer. And we we're like, okay. So so like literally the whole day when he was shooting, we were hiding in like a back room. And I, you know, I was a little bit younger then, so I like, and I was act, I was actor in the movie. So I scurried up my face and I went in with the grips to go meet him. <laughs> so that... I met Mick York as a grip on my own film production. So that way I didn't get punched in the face or um, have him not leave his trailer. The, you, you, he, and you hear stories about actors not leaving trailers and, and, you know, being difficult sometimes on set. And you hear these mythical stories. You're like, this can't really be true. And and I go, no, no. It, it can. Now, to back that up, Mickey was, um, he got through the day. We got all of his stuff shot. He seemed, and he was working great with the director. Mm -hmm. He was working great with the cast members. And I don't know if it was more of like just, you know, sometimes actors, they like to say or do things just to see if they can get away with it or just whatever. And But, you know, as the producer, you don't want to take that chance. A, I didn't want my face punched. And B, I didn't want him to not leave his set or trailer. So... Is there? Um, let me ask you on a producing standpoint, just on a legal standpoint, if I'm yeah. paying somebody half a million, quarter million dollars, and they do not perform the service I hired them to do, meaning like they are doing things that are creating havoc or not coming out of their trailer, I always wondered, there has to be some sort of legal ramification for this kind of behavior, right? Or if you don't well, want to answer that, please don't. I don't want to put you in a bad spot. I don't know. I don't think that's a bad spot. I mean, 
obviously you have a contract with them and there's obviously some stipulations and one of them primarily is being that they have to act <laughs> to I mean to be fair you know that's where it kind of can get really gray like if they show up to set and they do a scene or two and then they start making demands and they don't get the day done I mean they're not it can get really gray I mean it really can with some of these things like you, you know can you you can't put you know like I'll just say for instance like state law might dictate like, or wherever you're shooting might say like listen you 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 can only work a normal eight hour day or SAG rules mm -hmm. they only are an eight eight hour day they might do eight hours and then say hey I'm, I'm out done. I'm out I did my day so I mean you just <sighs> I've I've never experienced that myself where an actor has has not you know they're more you know if you treat them well mm -hmm. with you know, respect I, with respect you're doing everything that you can in order to i don't want to say accommodate them but you know just like just like they they want to work they want to work and they know they know the situation of like what you know like maybe you have them for three days they know this and they have so much they got to do and they're more than willing if you if you treat them with respect, if you're accommodating, if you're, you know, go out of your way to, you know, make sure that they have a good time, just in terms of like experience set, you know, they will go that extra mile for you because they, they are those, I mean, they're the artists. They want to, they want their work to be good. Did they you want to look good on the camera? So did you ever hear the story of Marlon Brando on the, on the set of the score with De Niro and Ed Norton? Oh, I want to say that I have, but please tell it. I'm the, sure it's going to... Because, um, what's, you know, Marlon Brando is legendary for being difficult. I mean, even The Godfather, he was being difficult. Because he was already Marlon Brando when he did The Godfather. And he was on this movie called The Score, which was directed by Frank Oz. Now, for many people who don't know who Frank Oz is, he's a very well-known director, but he also is known for being the voice of Yoda and also being the voice of... Um, uh, not the voice, but he puppet puppeted uh, Kermit the Frog. Uh, he he came up he came up as a mup, a Muppet, you know, a puppeteer. And 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 Marlon refused refused to even let him be on the set. Now, when those two forces, like the director and Marlon Brando, like and Marlon's like, I'm not acting if that puppet director and you know expletive expletive is there i'm not going to work so de niro had to direct brando on the set while poor frank oz was in a trailer radioing the directions to robert while totally that was believe and like you're like and robert's like come on marlon he's like no i'm not gonna work bobby i'll work with you ed i'll work with you I can't work with this puppet director, I, I, this puppet guy, this frog, frog effer, and <laughs> all sorts of stuff he was saying. But I heard this story, and you just like, and I've heard it multiple times from different people, and you're just like, those are the, that's where this stuff happens. This is where these myths start coming, like people becoming difficult. But also, once you do that once, this is a small business, and everyone hears it. And yeah. the, the next, so, you know, when you're Marlon Brando, you're Marlon Brando. Like, what are you, what are you going to do? It's Marlon Brando. Right. But, you know, when you're an actor, you know, a paycheck actor, meaning that you've got to work to keep the bills coming, you can't be pulling that kind of stuff for the most part. Yeah. And for the most part, they don't. But right. if you have a situation like that, you find yourself in with, with like a Marlon Brando type of situation, you've got to <laughs> pick your battles. And at the end of the day, at least in terms of a producer, like, you just got to get their footage. You got to get them shot. You got to get their face on camera. Get their scenes. Much, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, just that's so, it. And and they know that. You know, the actors know that. So, you know, they're being difficult because they know you got to get them shot. So I, I shouldn't say they're being difficult just because of that. But, you know, you got to pick your battles. And sometimes you got to, you know, you got to have Robert De Niro directing with. <laughs> no. I mean, do you find it that a lot of named actors and seasoned actors in general will test um, the director, will test the production, will test to see how far they can push something sometimes just to see what happens? I, I would say I would say yes. So always be prepared for that. 
But at the same time, like they're they're doing that because they want to see how co- how quality you are. Like, right. are you do you wither under pressure, or is this like a real thing? You know. So don't and don't you know be hesitant to speak your mind and 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 um, you know challenge them right back potentially, not in, like in a bad way. No, 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 absolutely. Like they will test every once in a while. Um, so be prepared for that. But you know, really, for the most part, like right off the bat. To, to avoid like the testing mm-hmm. is to like, if it's the director, the producer, whoever it is with the main talent, like go try, try to establish a rapport. They're mm-hmm. almost always, if they sign on to your project, they want to talk to the director. They want to mm-hmm. know, like go pick them up at the airport. You know, like you be, if it's, if it's all possible, and, and I'm talking about maybe more of the director, mm-hmm. but like be there, be there, talk. I mean, then they have to talk to you in the car and you can tell funny jokes. And you know, if they've written a book, read their book, read the book. You know, so you can talk about their book, you know, do, you know, talk about things that they enjoy and like, because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and, you know, they approach like, we're like, maybe for us as independent filmmakers, movies are lives. Like, this is my life. This is what I do. But for them, you know, they've been maybe more established in their career. Like this is their job. So, and sometimes people don't like to talk about their jobs. They like to talk about dogs. They like to talk about their cars, but you know what I mean? Like I can talk about just things and just kind of establishing that right away with them. That um, you're, you're, you know, not that the film's secondary, but like you really are excited to have them there and you just want to connect as a, you know, hey, let's just talk about, you know, funny stories and, and this and that. And that will really loosen them up to be like, okay, they're artistic, you know, because at the end of the day, these are artists. And yeah. artists have a tendency to really, you know, like the shy, can be very shy people, very, you know, personal people. And to be able to make them feel comfortable is is so important and it, it honestly will diffuse a lot of the issues that you might have with problems because if they feel comfortable you know then they then they're just they're free to express themselves as artists yeah that's that, that's what I was, uh, that's my feeling as well that d- actors is a general statement but let alone high profile actors they want to feel safe they want to feel that they're in good hands as a director speaking from a director's point of view and at the second that they see that there's some buffoonery going on, or they don't feel like they the director's got their back, or they can't, they're not safe. That's when the acting up happens. That's where I've seen that happen, and they start because they're defending themselves. They're like, you know what? If this guy's not gonna take care of me, if this girl's not gonna take care of me, then I'm gonna take care of myself, and this is how I'm gonna do it. Yeah, and and I always say like anyone can put up with anything for one day. <laughs> no, that's not to say that you need to abuse people by any means, but like yeah, yeah, anyone yeah. can think for a day so uh you know like when it comes to just you know be be up front and, and like if, you, if you're having issues on on set i mean right. with the thing like go to the actor apologize say hey we'll sure. work on you know just yeah just work it out it was because honestly act- like, they'll put up with it if they know that you're you know they're not they're, they know what the, they know that they're not on the studio set right and that's not to put down what you're doing by any means they, just, they, oh, no. they understand and if you are, you know, responsive to them as such of being cordial, that you won't have any issues. Did you ever listen to that um, that VO session with Orson Welles? That legendary VO session with Orson. You have heard that one, isn't that brilliant? <laughs> that is a br- for everyone listening. Orson Welles did a VO session for I think some sort of commercial, uh, some wine commercial or something. And this poor VO director, oh my God, he just ripped him for like 30 minutes it was just it was like a train wreck you couldn't you couldn't look away it's like that with the christian bale and the oh that was oh that was that was bro that was brutal that was that was brutal um now let me see oh the what well, do you have any other fun stories uh dolph story ron perlman story oh, okay. I can tell so one uh, fun Dolph Lund- Lundgren story is, and this will kind of tie in with we're shooting with Dolph, and I happen to be in a scene with him as well, and we were knife fighting, so we only had Dolph come in for uh, yeah we were doing a knife fight, and we didn't have any practice space, and he was only available for two hours, so we literally brought him into the production office, this little like twelve by six to to block the knife fight, so we're, we're with everyone else running around blocking the knife fight, and. And uh, I was literally like on the phone with SAG, like right before I was supposed to talk to him. They told I me, mean, and I won't go into the details, but basically I still needed to get the actors cleared. So they let me know 
So I needed to get the actors cleared, and then I had to knife fight Dolph. And then as soon as I got done knife fighting Dolph in the 20 minutes we did our steps, I had to get back on the phone with SAG to try to clear you know, the actors and Dolph to actually be in the, the film. So that was kind of a fun – he was – and like – for you know, obviously Dolph knows what he's doing in terms of action. Yeah. And very, I mean, we're like in a production office, like basically a little room. Everyone's re- copiers going, and we're blocking our knife fight scene. And uh, and I'm I'm just thinking this whole time, like, there's no way that he's not that he couldn't remember it, but like, there's no way this is gonna look good. Or you know, like we're, but no, we sh- like we shot it seven days later, and he knew it. He knew that knife fight like as if he had been practicing it for like you know, months to prepare for it and like knew every step. And it was just like, like he knew it. And we literally had 20 minutes in an office. So I thought that was just professional. Talk about about a professional. So let's talk about financing. Cause you know, this is all sounds great. You know, we got a great script. You've talked to the actors, the agents are happy. You know, they're ready to go. Then, there's that whole money thing. You've got to pay them and also have money for the budget of the film. Yeah. How, first of all, how do you finance the film? Uh, how do you finance most of your films and uh, what part of pre-sales come into that? And secondly, when you're, when you're trying to lock in an actor, a lot of times they need proof of funds um, yeah. or, or something along the, that line, correct? Correct, yes. Um, so for, at least for me and kind of what I've gotten um, blessed to be able to do is – with a lot of with uh, pre-sales movies and you know kind of your so the financing then and the distribution in a pre-sales movie are kind of tied hand in hand so let's let's say we're, we'll we'll use uh, Mickey Rourke as an example you might go to a distributor and say hey if I get Mickey Rourke in this movie so let's let's take it say it's a horror movie and if I get Mickey Rourke attached to this movie, what do you think that's worth? What would you give me? And they might come back to you and say, hey, we'll give you 100 grand to distribute your movie. And so you take that kind of offer and you go and say that's in the United States. And then you go to Germany and say, hey, if I have this horror movie with Mickey Rourke in it, what would you give me? And they say, nah, they'll give you 10 grand. Okay, great. 10 grand. So right now you got 110. And then you go, so you go to different territories, potentially, and say, hey, to distributors there, and say, hey, what do you give me? And maybe you add all that up to say, let's say $500,000, okay? So then you've got, you, my friend, have not necessarily, I mean, there's there's some more steps in there, but here, you've got $500,000 worth of value with your movie and Mickey Rourke, okay? So while that not, might not be money, that is worth something. Now, that's probably worth something to say, like, hey, we could actually probably approach Mickey Rourke. Well, assuming you hadn't maybe approached Mickey Rourke to do the movie in the first place. Mm-hmm. Let's like, OK, now we know we actually can have some money if we have Mickey Rourke in this movie. So then you go to Mickey Rourke and say, hey, what would it take for you to do this movie? You know, you make him offer. Bam, bam, bam. So, you know, and, and then so once you atta- once you. Connect the two the pre-sales, and, and we'll just say Mickey Rourke, then you can go to, there's a couple options for you. You can go to a bank of Los Angeles, I mean, I don't want to say like a Los Angeles bank, any bank will do it, but like a bank could, uh, you could take these pre-sales with the actor attached and say, hey, how much will you, with this, with these kind of offers, how much is the, like, would you loan against that? And they might say, hey, we'll give you, you know, $300,000. So there, there's your money. There's three hundred thousand dollars to make a movie. Now you got to go out and find maybe two hundred thousand dollars more, or maybe you've got. I don't want to say you've got two hundred thousand dollars in your pocket, but then you got it. You know, so automatically, your ability to then kind of go out to investors. You know, you've just you've just added. You know, if you go out to investors and you only need that's way easier to raise maybe two hundred thousand dollars than it is to raise five hundred thousand dollars. And, and opposed to even having to raise, you know, the budget of your movie without having any of these things, mm-hmm. you know, an, an actor or any any sales beforehand. So two things. One, yeah. I, I th- pre-sales is more rare nowadays, rarer nowadays than it used to be before. You really could do exactly what you're saying with 
it doesn't even need to be at a caliber of Mickey Rourke. Uh, how do you feel that the today's not, not literally today because we're in an upside down, but pre COVID, like, you know, just late 2019, what was the world like for pre-sales and is it, have you seen it become harder or easier? I think it's been, it's been better. It's been okay. bigger. I think the giant myth is that pre-sales are no longer a thing. Now, the actual value amount of mm -hmm. what your pre-sales can be is doubt. Yes, mm -hmm. that is, that is true. And that's where like the value is down, but like that's where if you're like a micro budget filmmaker, that's where your value as being able to do that has just increased. Right. Because you know how to do things way cheaper than uh, maybe someone else knew how to do it 10 years ago because the, value, the, the, the values have come down. And that, in my opinion, is across the board like on everything. And that has primarily to do with the DVD market just right. shrinking. And they haven't been able to mo completely monetize VOD or, you know, the streaming. VOD. Yeah. As soon as your movie goes, you know, on the internet, it's, or even released on DVD or released anywhere, it's Pirate City and everyone watches it for free. You know what I mean? Give or take. Yeah. It's just now it's available for free and now you're fighting Pirate City. So th that's the part that's the hard thing. So then we've got this whole chicken and egg situation where if you go to Mickey Rourke's people and go, hey, look, uh, what would it take? Well, we want 250, but I'm sure Mickey's getting hit up by producers in this. I've heard this. I've seen this happen. He gets hit up by producers daily and they just want his name to go, go to go raise the funding now. Yep. But a lot of them, they will not let you attach their name to the project unless they see verifications of them. So you kind of like need that money first in order to attach a Mickey Rourke in order to then go off and get pre-sales to get, you know, it's kind of like, so how does that work in today's world with it, you? Yeah. So it literally, and I, that does sound convoluted and complicated and it's, it's almost circular. Mm -hmm. and my answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay. And it literally, I mean, it's a fine dance. And I would rec I mean, that's why like bringing in having maybe someone a little bit experienced and being able to do that mm -hmm. is is very valuable to project. Not that they because it it's like it, it literally is that I mean that that and that is the film system in in a nutshell in a smaller world because like I'll let you in on the secret of Hollywood and. Alex, you probably know this. No one has any money. Shh, That's don't right. tell no one, no one does. <laughs> don't tell anyone. And so, but I think that's a fun, that's a basis to start with. And it, it, when you know this, okay, it makes it a lot easier to work in the circle to try to get the money to make a project. Because everyone, that's a basic building block of films, is no one has any money. And everyone secretly knows this. And so that's why it's like, okay, you know, a Mickey Rourke might say, okay, we won't let you attach your name unless you have the money. And then you, but you can kind of softly then approach someone with money to get the money because Mickey Rourke's softly attached. And then it's all kind of tied together and you just kind of keep working. You just keep working it in a circle until it Don't all comes it. together. So, um, I, the, I wish it was simpler. Oh, it, it should be. It, I mean, I and I and it should be, but like I've done several of these now, and each time I'm just like, it's just so easy. You just no, it's it works in a circle, and you just got to keep the circle going, right? Because if it stops, things will fall apart. Right. The mu if the music stops, you're gonna run out of chairs. <laughs> yes. What's the old well, What's the old joke in Hollywood? How do you How do you have a How do you um, How do you get How do you get a small fortune? And how do you make a small fortune in Hollywood? Oh, start, I don't know this. Uh, how do you make a small fortune in Hollywood? You start with a large fortune. <laughs> start with a large fortune. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I mean, it's, it's insane. Um, now, one thing about actors, and I have a lot of experience with this, and I would love to hear your point of view and if this is actually a thing, but I, I, my feeling is it isn't. But letters of intent. What the hell is it really worth? Is it worth anything? Is it just, it's just kind of fluff? Um, you know, because I remember when I was, you know, in my first book about making a movie with a mobster, uh, and well, we have this actor's letter of intent, and we had Oscar winning actor's letters of intent, and we never got money. It, it, it doesn't really mean anything from my point of view. I'd love to hear yours. Yeah. Um, 
I would say, <laughs> I would say like to have an actor with a letter, letter of intent, the value to that is if you've had someone, let's, and I'm just going to say like a director that has worked with that actor with the letter of intent, because then automatically, you know, it's a, it's a, like, it'll tell investors or like a financing bank that that's a real thing. Because you know, there's a relationship there. There is. I mean, they, yes. So if you, if you all of a sudden have a letter of intent from Dolph and from Mickey to be in a movie and that's what you have, you can go to investors like, well, he's already done movies with them. So this, this is a real thing. Yeah. This is a real thing. Yes. Yes. And that's why it's, I mean, I hate to say like, you, you, you need someone kind of like that on your project. It's super helpful. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's very helpful because, and, and not that those guys would then do it because this person's in the project, but like it, it adds to that level of, um, I want to say the showman, like believability, but it, no, no, it, no. It's a showman. You, you've, it's a, it's a it's smoke a and mirrors. It's smoke and mirrors. You kind of like, look, look over here. Look at the dance. Look at the dance. That circle going. You got to keep that circle going. And, and if, you know, like if, if have someone that has worked with, I mean, like I'll give you an example. Like I could message like probably. I'm I'm gonna say Mickey Rourke just because I know he's switched agents. But in the past, like I could at least message Mickey Rourke's agent and say like, "Hey, I am doing this project and this and this. Is is Mickey Rourke even available?" And he would get back to me because a, you know, we've paid him for something, and he would he would at least respond. Mm -hmm. And he would say like, "Oh, Mickey's schedule is is you know not available for nine months, or or whatever that is." And that, that's why like having that kind of value of, of a producer or someone attached to the project that has that ability is so helpful because it kind of cuts through all the BS right away. And you can know like, I mean, it's not that Mickey Rourke's not interested in your project. It's because he's just not even available. I mean, he, he could be, you know, on vacation. So, you know, then you can move on. You're not wasting time. Fair, fair enough. That um, make sense. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Now, with the distributor and pre-sales, when you, in your experience, when you're getting MGs, so essentially you're getting not an, you're getting MGs basically before you're, you're not just giving the movie and doing a profit participation. I call it, kind of like you said, like promise, promise, promise letters. The, like, we will pay you this once the movie's finished. But they are paying you once the movie's finished, so it's not like. This Correct. is yeah. These, these aren't um, not speculation. It's not uh, what are those called? Um, uh, what they think the movie's going to make. This could be worth, yeah. No, yeah. Were, this would be cash, know. cash in the pocket. Yeah. Right. So after that cash in the pocket comes in, you're hoping that all the cash that you're going to make off of the initial MGs is going to be not only enough to pay back your budget, but also maybe make a nice little profit because do you actually see back end? <laughs> do you actually, you know, with the way distribution is worked, is worked and the whole system is played out? I know. I'm, and dude, just say, Alex, I don't feel comfortable I asking. I, I think this is a great answer. Okay. So they always say in, in when you're trying to do distribution, whatever you're going to make, if they offer you, let's just say $20,000, that's all the money oh, yeah. you'll ever see. Right. And I would say that like you, you can take that saying to the bank every single time right. because it and but barring okay barring that if your film is like a sensational hit or a hit and then maybe you can you'll see some more money later on like down the road like maybe two or three years later and that, i'm not saying that's a lot of money but like you'll see some royalties come in maybe two or three years later down the road but whatever they're gonna offer you up front is about all they'll see I mean, and there, I mean, all you're going to see from whatever that territory is, or uh, let's just say U.S. just to make things simple. Mm -hmm. So yeah, whatever, whatever that MG is. If they're offering you no money mm -hmm. and they're going to pay you out off of, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that deal. Just like, just know that you will not just put that in your brain. You will not see any money ever. <laughs> That's what I've been yelling for <laughs> the top of the mountains for a while now. Have. I know you have. You you say in all your shows. I want and for those that are listening, like I listen to Alex's shows like from the beginning. So I've taken a lot of his advice to heart. So start at episode one and then you know, I think what are you on to? Maybe uh, three hundred and uh, yeah, no, something like three almost four we're getting close to four hundred now, sir. Listen to all of them. They're all irrelevant. 
you know, and you can stop buying and then you can be done. You, there's no, you'll learn everything now. No, um, so very important, but yes, I mean, please, 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 please. And, and, and that's to say like, if you're, if they're offering you just to distribute your film without paying you something up front, you won't see any money. I mean, the, the odds of you seeing any money are very, very slim. And so like, and, and maybe, I don't mean to paint doom and gloom on that scenario because maybe, you know, obviously you want to try to make mo money off your movie, but maybe that just, but literally the act of getting distribution for your movie right. has its own value. That means something when you're ready to make a second one or a so, third one. You so know? take it on the, so take it on the chin is, you might have to take it on the I chin. Take it on the chin. You on the first. To, but you might have to take it on the chin. So just realize that if, if you're in that situation, you have, you know, it, you might have to take it on the chin in order to get that distribution because that act of distribution literally will help you on the next one. That, that's 100%. It 100% will help. Right. But, so if you, if you get picked up by Lionsgate or, you know, Warner Home Movies or, you know, or one of these distribution companies like that, that are up, upper echelon, not, yeah. not lower end echelon, but higher echelon. But even lower guys, I mean, just that act of like, of being able to get, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things where they, they always say, like, well, I can get your movie in Walmart. You know, oh, like, oh, that's still, oh. that might not equal any dollars, but it means something. Or theatrical. You know, or, or limited theatrical. Oh, uh, don't even. <laughs> what, what do you think about limited theatrical? Well, I mean, obviously right now theatrical is a big question mark. But before COVID. Like, forget theatrical. Like if they're trying to tantalize you with limited theatrical, that means they'll play it in, if they play it at all, I mean, if they actually do it, they'll play it in 10 cities and they'll run it on a weekend in some small theater that no one, they won't have any press about to play. I mean, it will be limited. And they <laughs> probably somewhere. use that as a way then to charge you, you know, a lot of money in expenses. So he just used not, he used he just used air quotes for people not watching sorry, this. There was air sorry, quotes. I forgot. Really. <laughs> it, yes, I put expenses in air quotes, and but I will throw I will throw if if it if it me but saying that okay. A theatrical run, a limited theatrical run, could help the film out in order to get on Netflix. Let's just say right. And how about for so, foreign? How about for foreign? If it's a U.S. And, limited, and for foreign. Just depending. So, you know, it, it, so maybe you got to take that on the chin as well. So, uh, so I want to be very clear about this, everyone listening. You, the way that you're making money with your films is by stacking the cast with value that has pre-sale value to distribution companies around the world in different territories. If you don't have that pre pre that that valuable cast, pre-sale value cast. Uh, you won't sell your movie. You won't get any pre-sale money. You won't, not pre-sale money, but you won't even get any offers. You will get no MGs. And then now you're in the world of, I'm going to donate my film, a tax, a, a non-tax deductible donation to a film distributor. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, and, and yes. But I, like I said, like maybe that's what you have to do in order to take that next step on the next one. I'm I'm speaking maybe more for those micro budget filmmakers. Out right. There. Yeah. You don't want to throw a million dollar movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you you know if you make a film for five thousand dollars and you're able to go through all these steps and get yeah. distribution, and yeah. even if you're not going to make any money, dude, you're only out five grand and you get distribution on your movie. That's huge. That means right. someone in the distribution world sees value at least enough for them to even just put on this. Go. They'll they have to spend a little bit of money to put your stuff out there. Like that's a huge deal. And, and don't let that discourage you, you know, and you're only out, you'd only be out five grand, which is like huge because when you get into that, you know, <laughs> let's say a hundred thousand dollars plus, I mean, you could literally, you could be in the exact same boat except be out a hundred thousand dollars. Right. That's okay. why my first film cost me about five grand and I got it sold to Hulu and sold it overseas and, and, you know, got it on different platforms and stuff. And, it was five grand. My last film was three <laughs> and I got distribution for that. I was like, okay, great. And it's a big deal because you know, like it would, it, and it, that helps for things like when you approach talent or investors, right? 
And they're like, okay, well, at least he got a film to the distribution's point. Like, we know it, it got out there to start selling. I mean, mm -hmm. they well, there might be some things that a, an investor might not totally understand, but they definitely understand, like, hey, his last movie at least got to distribution, and I can actually watch it on a physical, like, I don't want to say DVD, but they, they can actually see it come right. to market. And that's a huge deal. Get the and film to market. How important are film markets to your process? Like AFM can. I mean, I think they're important. Um, you know, for, for the producer in me hates them because all it is is just a bunch of added expense, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that film will have to go through, uh, especially in today's world when you can like send out a screener out to just about anyone and they can watch the film and check out, they can see it from their home and if they want to buy it, they'll, they'll go after it. If not, they won't. But it is um, for the industry. You know, sometimes it's that showmanship factor that, you know, you got to be in that game to some extent in order to be taken seriously. That's not to say that you're not a serious person, but that's still that part of that Hollywood. Perception. You know, it's perception. Keepers. Yeah, it's and to perception. be there at a market, you know, mm -hmm. with a, maybe an established sales rep selling your film, you know, helps, you know, well, helps you in your filmmaking journey and career. Do now, you? that might so I'd be financially, but it does help. Do you use sales reps? I do. And, but these are pre-built relationships that, of, of sales reps that you actually trust. Yes. Yeah. I've got, honestly, like I've got one go-to sales rep team that I use for like all of my stuff. And mm -hmm. I've had that relationship since the first movie that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, if I can give a piece of advice to like being able to establish, I, I think there's like a a misconception about sales reps that is partially true, but also <laughs> built upon, you know, like just the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. First approaching a sales rep and you're, uh, I don't want to say a nobody, but like you don't have anyone in your movie. You, you don't, you know, it's maybe not a genre that's super sellable. And if they take you on, you know, like there's a lot of, you know, like that movie will have a hard time selling. Like it's just, you know, it, it, my family's in, does real estate. Like I always did real estate. And one of the things that I've always learned is that, listen, I can get up and, and you can price your house at this price. At the end of the day, I still got to show the house and someone's still got to buy it. So if it's not the house, you know what I mean? Like if the house is not worth it, the buyers will let you know. And so a sales rep company, they, they'll give you all of the lights, the, 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 the showmanship and the lights and glamour and the estimates. But at the end of the day, your movie has to sell. Like it's your product that they're selling. They can't sell it for you. Now, obviously there's some things that they can do to, you know, like help, mm -hmm. but like at the end of the day, it's the product. So my, my piece of advice then is like, just realize that like it's your product. So sometimes that doesn't mean it's bad, but like then to, so pick a sales rep for your, your project that you, you feel maybe comfortable with and trying to build and establish that relationship. And then, but, and also realize that maybe they're not going to make it have, they're not going to make me any money off this movie, but you know what? That 10 year relationship potential that you could develop with them will, will pay off in dividends just because obviously, you know, like you'll establish that rapport. They know you're a filmmaker that can deliver a movie, mm -hmm. you know, then you kind of go, maybe the next one you have a talent. Well, then all of a sudden you're like, they know you're a filmmaker that can deliver with talent and they'll help push you and they'll help guide you into things to help your, your career along. They will be there for you, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta build that relationship with them. It can't be a, here's my product. How about you sell it? And when they don't do that, then you, you, you burn the house down and you leave. I mean, now saying all those things like, mm -hmm. yes, there are predators out there and you, oh. that's why it's important to, so important to call other producers, but you know, there's a lot of really great established sales reps and you just want to, you know, go in there thinking, Hey, I want to I don't want people to sell my movie. I want to start a relationship with them. The you know, I think, uh, cause I know a lot of sales reps as well. I know, I know the handful that are, I know a handful of good ones. I got ripped off by one early on in my career episode. I think number two or three of the show was me ranting about producers reps and sales reps um, because I was still, I was stole 10 grand off of me back in the day. But I feel that a lot of times that 
producers reps and sales reps get bad raps is they'll pick up a movie that has no talent, quote unquote, no marketable talent, um, and they try to do their best. And it generally the market will say no. Um, yeah. But if you but if you show up with a movie with Dolph or Raw or Ron Perlman or someone of you know some sort of marketable talent. Um, it makes their job a lot easier. They can pick up the call and call Germany, call two or three buyers in Germany and go, I got a Mickey Work movie here. What can you give me for it? And that's the va- that's why you hire someone like that because they have those automatic connections uh, to all these buyers around the world uh, that you just don't. Yeah, and they'll play ball with you. So like, let's, if your first film totally tanks just because of the, you know, not because it's a, a bad movie, it's just because it just didn't have the glitz and the glamour that it takes for a distributor to sell, pro, you know, to the best of their ability. You know, the, if you kind of, if you do approach them with like, hey, I've got this horror film that if we had Mickey work, the distributor might go, whoa, let me make some calls for you. Mm-hmm. Right there. And that a guy, I'd work in it. Exactly. Now, which leads us to uh, my final question, um, COVID-19. And how production is going to be moving forward, how the film markets are being affected, what you think, in your personal opinion, from being a veteran in the business, how do you think things are going to be moving forward? Like, and I know nobody knows the answer to this, but I just like to hear your opinion about first of all production and then also film markets because I don't know about you, like I'm not going to AFM this year, even if I'm invited. I'm like I'm not going to a public event in 2020, yeah. pretty much. So. How can you do a film market without <laughs> hundreds yeah. of thousands of people grouped in together? If you want my opinion, now, Grand, this is my opinion. And let me give you some background. I'm a history major by trade. Okay. So I always approach things just naturally because it's who I am by looking into the past to predict the future. Okay. I was just, I was, it's I was very school, s- sound advice, sound advice, sir. Okay. So my advice would be history has always rewarded the bold and this is an opportunity for the bold to yes. i mean I, i'm not recommending that you go out there and and make your movie you know put people at risk i mean stay for all of these things but i mean there a whole industry is ground to a halt and those that are willing to go out and be creative this and make craft and create will be rewarded that's just my opinion so and you know and and i'm not saying they you know, like that's a so that's my right now i think eventually if we look into the the future i think things by i think by like productions will limp along here this fall like in terms of just what's happening like there'll be They'll, they'll try to make some things work. I think by next year, this will all be in our rear view mirror. Hopefully. I think things will be back on track. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we'll see a giant spike in, you know, um, profitability potential off of VOD because a lot of people are staying at home and getting used to um, watching now things on TV and streaming. I think that will only help boost the streaming markets from the, in the, into the future. And so that will be, which is great for independent filmmakers, independent films, because that's been the one area that's been a real big hit on just our ability to make income from our work. Um, I think, unfortunately, you know, theaters will have a really hard time, you know, uh, uh, but I, I, I always foresee like the big tentpole movies, the big budget stuff you know, the Marvel movies, I think that's the only way to really experience them. I agree. Isn't it? So like can. that relief. So they'll, the, the theaters will be okay, but I do think it will, you know, very, it won't be, it's, you know, it's hard to be profitable as an independent doing theaters anyways. I think it just will be the death, be a real death sentence to like, don't even bother taking it to theaters. That's not to say that there's not some allure to it, you know. But also, and I'll I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll play devil's advocate here. If there isn't a lot of studio um, product for all these screens, there might be opportunities for right. independents yeah. to to the come point. in and and to, and because to, honestly, beforehand the studios are only making thirty movies a year, forty movies a year. You've got a lot of great videos on how to market and distribute your movie. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that there is, um, 
especially with theaters, there's a giant missed opportunity to just focus in on theaters and marketing your film mm-hmm. and keeping it in that world. And I could go, I could, I mean, that's its own like. Oh, no, it's its own thing. And I've had guests on who've made millions, millions yeah. theatrically, yeah. self distributing and four walling and booking their own theaters. And, and, and it's a thing, but it's a it lot is. of work. And it's, it's a, a lot. Of work. And if you're, you know, if you're in the most creatives like to do their project, get it out there and then move on. And that's right. what, that's why it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, like live in your film for another two years that that could take or whatever, you know what I mean? Oh no, I, I've been trying to tell people like the, the, the real work starts at the end of the cut. Uh, that's when the real work start. Like the hardest part is not getting the movie made. The hardest part is getting the money back. <laughs> Well, and so Alex, that's why with this, the pre-sales that we've kind of been talking about, mm-hmm. you, if you can do that process of, of, you know, attaching the talent to the, you're doing a lot of work and that's oh, a yeah. circular, but you're doing it almost before you start shooting mm-hmm. instead of, and as opposed to after. And so like the same, it's the same amount of work, except that you're taking that to risk. actually to, yeah, you're, you're taking that risk away from what you're trying to do and you're, you're putting it on the front end. And so that's why it's, it's, in my opinion, if you're able as a filmmaker to be able to get to that point where you can like, okay, Hey, we're going to raise, that's why the, the distribution and the financing you can tie together and put it towards the front end of you trying to make a movie because then you could spend two years in that circular motion. Oh, and it's way better to do that than to have, done the six months in pre-production trying to raise the money, scrape out money, shoot the film, post-production, and then spend two years trying to sell it. And it's just... It you want to hedge your bets. So much yeah, you just want to hedge your bets uh, if, if you can. It's like, you know, when, when Apple creates an iPhone, they know that they have a market, they have an infrastructure, they have sale... Predi- you know, they, they know that they're going to recoup whatever money they spent to make or design or invent that product filmmakers never think about that they're the only business we were when i use the term business it's very loosely in our in, in show business but we're the only product that's like i'm gonna go spend a half a million dollars and then figure out how i'm gonna get my money back there's no other business that does that yeah no and it's very true and that's why if you can if you can take that the business side of things and throw that in on the front end of your movie mm-hmm. you know this will make your life not easier, but it'll be more enjoyable. You'll enjoy the product and so much. I mean, not that you're not going to have stress, but man, it's a lot easier to, you know, only have to worry about maybe, you know, 10% of your budget coming back as opposed to like a hundred percent of your budget coming back. Even just breaking even is a win, <laughs> right? It's a win. It's a complete win. Yeah. Don't, you know, if you break even on your movie, that is a win. 100% win. Like, Again, no other business, no other business. Is that a win? Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, here's the here's the the other secret. Like you keep at it long enough and you right. will have you will have that that product catapult. And I mean, one of the things I know we didn't really talk about or, or maybe like investors, investors. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I always like to tell investors is like, listen, maybe it's not this movie. I'm asking you for this. And 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 this is why, you know, this is going to work. And maybe it's not this movie that we make a lot of money on. And but it's going to help us get to that next level. And then when we get to that next level, maybe, you know, I'm going to ask you for more money. And maybe it's not that movie that's going to make us the money. But, but I'll get you, but I'll get, get your movie. I'll get your money back. You'll get on the red carpet. You'll get to meet some stars. And then when we get to that next level, I'm going to ask you for even more money. But that'll be the point where we're going to take off know, really, really well. And you know what? An investor can see that because it's just like any business. They understand the risks. And if they see like, hey, this person has got a, a plan and a future and they know where they're going and they know that this is, you know, it, it, you, you're not <clears throat> an investor. I shouldn't say they're not worried about 20% because they are, but like they're investing in movies. There's a lot of glitz and glamor, but they want to have the huge hit where they, you know what I mean? Like that's what, that's why they're investing. That's why they're investing in it's the movies. upsell, the upside. It's you, the upside. Yeah. You have to, you have to explain that to them. Like that is your goal as well. And, but it might not, you know, like it might not be the project that you're making for them right there at that moment, but you have to get, you have to take those steps in order to get there. That's the only way. It's the only way to be able to, to proceed forward. 
Fair and enough. they'll respect that. They'll see that. They'll respect that. And it'll add that level of like, I've, I've solidly will invest in, in these steps that maybe we're going to take. Very cool. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests, as you know, if you've listened to the show, yeah. what these are, um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Collaborate, collaborate the, the film, uh, filmmaking is such a collaborative business at all levels. And, and, you know, even collaborate with everyone on your team. I mean, we all know if you look at the back end of the credits, there's hundreds of people that work on your film and collaborate with as many, you know, of all the people that, you know, all the, all the people that'll help you make your film and your project, collaborate with them. They're going to have good ideas. They're going to have bad ideas. Roll with it. Take it. Let it sink in. And then it's like producers, all this stuff, because it's such an, it's an art form. It's like molding clay. You know, there's things that will happen that you, so you got to collaborate and you got to trust those around you to be immersed in that process. And I think of all the things that, you know, filmmakers have a, a tendency to lose is just that, that art. I mean, they don't forget it. They don't forget about the art form, but that art takes others, especially in our business and let bring their, bring, you know, other people's, you know, art to life with them. And it will just, there'll, there'll be magic there. I mean, that's where the magic's created. So collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Perseverance. Hmm. Severe. Don't give up. Don't stop. You're going to have uh, so many pitfalls in, in, in life, in filmmaking, and they're going to seem like instrumental hurdles. And maybe at that moment in time, it's going to seem insurmountable insurmountable but with some time and and persistence and patience like you'll get past those things life will go on things will keep moving forward it's just like this COVID-19 I'm literally sitting here just like I have had a couple projects that were literally I mean I literally like I was on a movie that I'm producing that I literally had just driven to Montana the day before pre-production was supposed to get started in March to start shooting like for pre-production to start and that's when the national emergency started and all the dominoes started falling and everything was put on hold. And I just was like, Oh my gosh, we're just like at that point, this movie is going to get made. Mm -hmm. And it was the day before the movie was supposed to get made. You know what I mean? Like where everything would have been sealed done. So I only tell that because like, you just got to be patient the, your timing will come. Your moment will be there and you just got to be ready for it. And I think that's hard, especially in our business to be able to just, you know, sit still. So three of your just, favorite film and three of your favorite films of all time. Okay. So I know you asked this to everybody and I was like, <laughs> I have a list of like, like art films. I was like, Oh, that are my favorite, but and not that I don't want to give those bosses. Like I want to like talk to Lord of the Rings. Okay, okay. Which one, which one, the whole thing. Fellowship of the ring. Okay. That was the first time I sat in a theater and I saw when those guys, when the, when the hobbits and everyone is going across the, I, I'd read the book but I had seen the book come to life and I just sat back. I was like, I want to do this. I want to make this, whatever this is, I want to do that. So that was a big deal to me. Um, probably the other one is, uh, star Wars no. empire strike. Uh, I know I'm given like, uh, generic, generic, big, big budget ones, but you know, like just the, like ones that I watch all the time. And then, uh, a world war two movie called Kelly's heroes. Yeah, I remember Kelly's Heroes, yeah. But it is a comedy. It's so funny. And uh, I would recommend if you have not seen Kelly's Heroes, watch Kelly's Heroes. It's like the best combination of story, you know, historical accuracy, actors, and comedy. It's great. Donald Sutherland's in it. Fantastic. It's fun. It's a, it's a good flick. I remember it. Um, and now where can people find you? Like in terms of how they can get a hold of your per, your personal your personal address, if you could, and uh, no, phone number. No, I'm joking. But how can people find you online, sir? If you want yeah. to even put that information out there. Yeah, yeah. Just get my wallet out, and here you go. Just, <laughs> exactly. just for people, just for people that are gonna see the video, you gotta it's sneak. A, Social security card will be fine. Everything. <laughs> uh, so the, probably the best way is you know IMDb me, mm -hmm. Stephen Luke on there. I think I got my email on there. Um, shoot me a message. 
you know, say hi, check in. Um, I'm always open to give advice, especially via email. I mean, that's easy. I say that because I, I have a lot of stuff going on and email is kind of the best way for me to keep track of like, not what I said, but like, oh yeah, okay. I'm, I can, I tune myself back into the, maybe a conversation better that way. So that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, you know, you can, some of my stuff is on, I'd recommend, you know, I'll do a shout out. Like some of my stuff is on Amazon prime. Give it a watch. I need mm -hmm. the seven cents per hour that, that could seven. Happen. First mean, of all, you're getting seven I, cents. It, Holy is it, cow. Is no, it down to five? It's a penny. Is it down to three? Oh, it's, it's a, a penny, penny now. So it's a between no. penny and 12 cents. So if you're good, you get up to 12 cents, but generally everyone's at a penny. Oh, geez. Well, I've got to film at least at seven. So let me give you. There wow. You Wait a minute. You've got a seven cents an hour movie. I, that's I quality. It's quality. I, I didn't know that was such a big deal. Now I'm more excited about the seven cents. Oh, you kidding me? Seven so cents. You need is... to check out my films then online. I mean, geez, apparently I'm making Muko bucks. Oh, no. Know. Seven cents. You're a seven cents an hour filmmaker, my friend. That is something to put on. That's like an Oscar. Like you're, you're up there. I don't know about Oscar. <laughs> I don't know about all of my films, but I've seen one that was a couple of years ago. I don't know. I, <laughs> and now I feel, it, you know, what's funny is we're having this conversation. It's like, Oh, seven cents an hour. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, boy. Do you see oh, what, what <laughs> we're, this is a ridiculous business. We're in an absolutely I, ridiculous business, but, but we can't do anything else. We're stuck here. It's, it's storytelling. It's, that's it's sto telling stories. And, you know, it all bites us and we all got a story to tell. And Yeah, man. You know, best formats film. Luke, it has been an absolute pleasure, man, talking to you. This has been a, a just knowledge bomb filled episode, which I knew it would be. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think it's I'm going to make sure this is mandatory listening for all filmmakers because it, it, I covered things in this and you and I covered things in this episode that we've never I've never really had on the show before. So uh, it is. It's really, really great I, stuff. So I want to share with everybody and I want to at least leave with this last, like I am a filmmaker out of South Dakota. I went to Los Angeles for a few years and now I'm back doing the films where, where I live. So let that be an encouragement to all of those people sitting and saying like, how can I do this? Totally doable. You can do it from even little state of South Dakota. So just keep hanging in there. Luke, thanks again, my friend. I appreciate it. Stay safe out there. Awesome. You too. Stay safe. We'll talk soon.